you so much. It was so sweet of you to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I think someone is supposed to come whisk this lectern away. Um, otherwise, <laughs> here we go. Um, we'd stand it. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what a great, what a great day. I mean, uh, Dr. Jim Billington is with us right here, the Librarian of Congress. And, uh, and Jim and Laura Bush together saw the vision of, of a day like this 10 years ago, uh, of bringing hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on a hot day to the National Mall to talk about books, buy books, and uh, listen to authors talk about books. And what a, what a great thing it is. So my job here today is basically to say to Steve, so tell me the one about. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, but first, I know that you like to talk about why you wrote this book in the first place. That's true. Um, and uh, thank you. Uh, what did you say your name was? <laughs> uh, we just had our 44th anniversary. I'm still getting used to it. Uh, Although, you know, the best line about Steve's best line, really, about marriage is not in the book. But it is that you can tell a good marriage by the number of teeth marks on your tongue. <laughs> from biting it. Uh, candor is vastly overrated. Uh, but, uh, I grew up in a family uh, of immigrants. My grandparents are immigrants from Russia and Poland. I grew up in a town in New Jersey, uh, Bayonne, New Jersey, where uh, everybody I knew had a grandmother with an accent. Um, I did too, they just had southern accents. <laughs> And uh, I grew up, uh, Bayonne was about 80% Catholic and about 19% Jewish, which is what we were. I thought Protestants were a tiny minority group, I, <laughs> some weird sect. Imagine my surprise when I went to Harvard. <laughs> All these names on the building, Elliot, Weld, Winthrop, so short, <laughs> so crisp. And they ended in consonants. I. Um, but uh, it left me with a lifelong interest in immigration. As Allison said, I did a book about my own grandparents' immigration to America. Um, and uh, I then started teaching. All through my writing career, I've written about immigrants. But I started teaching at George Washington University. And I started getting these stories in a writing class uh, of my students from Ukraine and from Vietnam and from El Salvador who were living today the story my grandparents had lived 100 years ago. And that was really the inspiration for the book. Um, almost all of my writing over the years has ruthlessly exploited my family. Uh, and having used up all of that material, I turned to my students. And, uh, and in payment for exploiting them, I actually dedicated the book to my students at GW, <laughs> some of whom are here today. But uh, uh, that was really the inspiration for it. And, um, and you found that there really are, uh, there's some things that are very similar to your grandparents' immigration in the early 20th century, and some things that are very different. Well, uh, uh, my friend Jamie Morris, who just preceded me, uh, made the point that um, uh, historically, immigration uh, was a very lonely process. Um, when my grandfather left Bialystok, which is now in eastern Poland, he was out of touch with his own sister for 50 years. 50 years. There was no Skype. There was no cell phone. There was no internet. 50 years, uh, she was behind the Iron Curtain. And the truth is, today, there are still things about immigration that never change. Every immigrant in the history of the world leaves something behind. They leave their graves of their ancestors. The air never smells the same anywhere else. The food never tastes quite the same. So this pain of separation is common to every immigrant story in the history of the world. In the 13th century, a Persian mystic named Rumi wrote something called the Song of the Reed. And he said, when a reed is plucked from a reed bed and you blow through it, it makes a very plaintive sound, which is the sound of the pain of separation. <laughs> 
that the reed feels from having been separated from the reed bed. An immigrant from Afghanistan said to me, that's how I feel having left Af Afghanistan. I'm the reed who's been plucked from the bed playing that plaintive sound. But on, in other ways, the this, this situation is very different. I have a student who, uh, whose uh, brother married a, a woman from Brazil. She was from Brazil. And um, the woman's family couldn't come to America for the wedding. So my student in her bridesmaid's dress and a digital camera and a laptop went to the wedding, took all these photographs, put them up on the web, and the bride's family back in a tiny village in Brazil watched the, watched the wedding in real time on the surrounding a laptop in their village. My grandfather didn't get to do that. <laughs> so some things never change, but other things are very different. And, uh, but, but you do still have people leaving, your grandparents left essentially because they were persecuted as Jews in Eastern Europe. And you found a family for whom a very similar story, they weren't necessarily persecuted, but they certainly couldn't fulfill their life's ambitions in Ukraine as Jews. This is actually a family whose son was a student of mine. Uh, and um, uh, Nick and Sarah Stern grew up as young Jews in the Ukraine at a period when uh, anti-Semitism had actually gotten worse, not better, because Nick's mother was a doctor. He couldn't aspire to be a doctor because all Jews, uh, by Edict of Stalin, had been prevented from going to uh, medical school. So he became an engineer. It was about the only profession open to young Jews, and so did Sarah. She became an engineer as well. They met in their first job. And you know, immigration starts with an active imagination. It starts with a sense of, there is another life out there for me, somewhere else. And I said to the Stearns, where did that spark of imagination come from? So Sarah said, well, we had a family friend who had moved to Israel. And she wrote a letter that my mother read to me. And the letter said, you know, here in Israel, we eat oranges the way you eat potatoes. And that orange became a symbol of another life. And then she said, I used to watch Italian movies. The Russians would never let in American movies, but they would let in movies made by Italian communists, like Fellini and Carlo Ponti. So she said, I would watch these movies, and I never listened to the plot. I looked at the apartments. <laughs> now, my grandfather, the right. sainted Avram Rogovsky, when he came to America and went back in the mid-60s, he decided when he saw Russia, that the great chink in the Soviet armor, what would pull down the entire Soviet empire, was plumbing. He was right. And that, and that if Russians could see American bathrooms, they would arise as one and revolt against the Russians. He now, was, of course, he, he was, was basically, basically right, right yeah. of course. He was a nutball, but he was right. <laughs> but the Stern story was similar. It was the apartments. It was the, the, the way of life that they saw in these movies. And then finally, they, they decided to emigrate, and it was very difficult. But tell what Sarah's apartment was like. Well, Sarah's apartment, she lived in an apartment where 28 people shared one bathroom. 28 people. And they were well off. Her parents were professional people. So there were certain other impulses to emigrate, and they finally uh, got up their courage to emigrate. But at the time, there was a system. The Soviets were just starting to allow people to emigrate. But they... Um, you had to get invited by some relative from abroad. The fiction was it was family reunification. So you had to have a letter from Cousin Morris in Brooklyn saying, I want the Stearns to join me. There actually didn't have to be a Cousin Morris, but you had to get the information to Hayas, the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society in Vienna, who could file a phony application for you. And you had to get the information out. But the Soviets censored this information. They wouldn't let it out. So Nick was a pretty smart guy. He wrote down on little tiny pieces of paper all of the vital information they needed for the application. And he had Sarah sew the little pieces of paper into the elastic of his boxer shorts. And they would give the boxers, every time a Jewish family left Ukraine, they would give him a pair of Nick's boxer shorts and say, here, bring the boxers to Hayas in Vienna, tell them to look in the elastic for our information. It took him 20 tries. As Nick says, you know, there are a lot of guys in Vienna walking around in my underwear. And so they finally get out, they breach the border, they're headed for Vienna, 
they stop for uh, a Coke. And uh, Nick runs off the, 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 the train, he buys the first bottles of warm Coca-Cola he's ever had. <laughs>